I don't. So why don't we do a little bit of uh, the Phaedrus? <clears throat> I had a couple of questions. I think there's a mistake in the text, and therefore we can just kind of rip out those pages. I'm for all. No. I'm all for making the book lighter. It's so happy to carry it around. <laughs> Thought I'd help. I thought what we would do is start with Socrates, since we're working backwards, pick up at Socrates' second speech. And um, <clears throat> the question that I think is kind of fun Like what steps or stages are involved in Socrates' second speech? Is there any order to it? Uh, after all, he's talking about love. And we know that the preceding speeches were about the non-lover. So given this subject, what's, what's the rational? Is there some structure here? And therefore, how can we picture it is where we want to play it. Right, that's what we want to play. So would you agree might be good to do our usual slow reading? Get a couple of people to act it out since it's a dialogue between the second speech of Socrates and the art of rhetoric. And uh, so it should, I think, would you agree? Like two thirty four. I wanted to let people know that Bookman Two is going out of business. So you mm. will be able to get if if you're lucky and nobody's bought everything up, but there's some good buys. Play those dialogues. You'll get an Odyssey. They're all about what Beach from, and Garfield, and in um, I think one the other ones in Costa Mesa. I'm not sure, but mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. They're really a good. They were a good bookstore. They had a lot of good stuff. 
Thanks, Regina. Yeah, prices are good. Uh, maybe 13 pages. And this is the interlude that takes place between the two. And I included in this 247 a beginning of his speech um, in order to simply you know, add a little bit of substance to it. <laughs> because it actually ends at 244A. So if we can take it into two pieces, 234A to 244, and then 244 to 247, then we can look at uh, a couple of curious questions. Uh, fair enough? Need a couple of readers who would thank you. Going once, one reader. Fame, fame. How about you sit just to the left of the book? Okay. Last one. Yes. Well, actually. To the left. You're fine, but if, if, if I have um, Susan between us. So could you move up here a little bit? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mark. It's just so Pierre can write on. You're fine, Susan. Write on the blackboard. You and me. Oh. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Uh, yeah, can you bring it much closer to me, Oh, sure. Do you want to be Socrates? Do you want to be Socrates? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking of not volunteering today, but he brought up we're going to get into the actual speech, and I couldn't resist. It's 234, right? <laughs> or didn't want to. 234. 234D. What do you think of the discourse, Socrates? Is it not wonderful, especially in dic diction? More than that, it is miraculous, my friend. I am quite overcome by it. And this is due to you, Phaedrus, because as I looked at you, I saw that you were delighted by the speech as you read. So thinking that you know more than I about such matters, I followed in your train and joined you in the divine frenzy. Indeed. So you see it fit to make fun of it. Do I seem to you to be joking and not to be in earnest? Do not jest, Socrates, but in the name of Zeus, the god of friendship, tell me truly, do you think any other of the Greeks could speak better or more copiously than this on the same subject? What? Are you and I to praise the discourse because the author has said what he ought, and not merely because all the expressions are clear and well-rounded and finely turned? For if that is expected, I must grant it for your sake, since because of my stupidity, I did not notice it. I was attending only to the rhetorical manner, and I thought even Lysias himself would not think that satisfactory. It seemed to me, Phaedrus, unless you disagree, that he said the same thing two or three times, as if he did not find it easy to say many things about one subject, or perhaps he did not care about such a detail, and he appeared to me in youthful fashion to be exhibiting his ability to say the same thing in two different ways and in both ways, excellently. Nonsense, Socrates. Why, that is the especial merit of the discourse. He has omitted none of the points that belong to the subject, so that nobody could ever speak about it more exhaustively or worthily than he has done. Well, that's where I must cease to agree with you. For the wise men and women of old who have spoken and written about these matters will rise up to confute me, if to please you, I agree. Who are they? And where have you heard anything better than this? I cannot say just at this moment, but I certainly must have heard something, either from the lovely Sappho, 
or the wise Anacreon, either from the love, uh, or perhaps from some pose, prose writers. What ground have I for saying so? Why, my dear friend, I feel that my own bosom is full, and that I could make quite another, I could make another speech different from this, and quite as good. Now, I am conscious of my own ignorance, and I know very well that I have never invented these things myself. So the only alternative is that I have been filled through the ears like a pitcher from the wellsprings of another. But again, because of my stupidity, I have forgotten how and from whom I heard it. Most noble Socrates, that is splendid. Don't tell, even if I beg, how or from whom you've heard it. Only do as you say. Promise to make another speech better than that in the book, and no shorter and quite different. Then I promise, like the nine archons, to set up at Delphi a statue as large as life, not only of myself, but of you also. You are a darling and truly golden, Phaedrus. If you think I mean that Lysias has failed in every respect and that I can compose a discourse containing nothing that he has said, that I fancy could not happen even to the worst writer. For example, to take the subject of his speech, who do you suppose in arguing that the non-lover ought to be more favored than the lover, could omit praise of the non-lover's calm sense and blame of the lover's unreason, which are inevitable arguments, and then say something else instead? No. Such arguments, I think, must be allowed and excused. And in these, the arrangement, not the invention, is to be praised. But in the case of arguments which are not inevitable and are hard to discover, the invention deserves praise as well as the arrangement. I concede your point, for I think what you say is reasonable. So I will make this concession. I will allow you to begin with the premise that the lover is more distraught than the non-lover. And if you speak on the remaining points more copiously and better than Lysias, without saying the same things, your statue of beaten metal shall stand at Olympia besides the offering of Cephalids. Have you taken my joke in earnest, Phaedrus, because to tease you I laid hands on your beloved? And do you really suppose I am going to try to surpass the rhetoric of Lysias and make a speech more ingenious than his? Now, my friend, you have given me a fair hold, for you certainly must speak as best you can, lest we be compelled to resort to the comic, you're another. Be careful, and do not force me to say, Oh, Socrates, if I don't know Socrates, I have forgotten myself. And he yearned to speak, but feigned coyness. Just make up your mind that we are not going away from here until you speak out what you said you had in your breast. You are alone in solitary spot, and I am stronger and younger than you. So under these circumstances, take my meaning and speak voluntary rather than under compulsion. But my dear Phaedrus, I shall make myself ridiculous if I, a mere amateur, try without preparation to speak on the same subject in competition with a master of his art. Now listen to me. Stop trying to fool me, for I can say something which will force you to speak. Uh, then please don't say it. Yes, but I will. And my saying shall be an oath. I swear to you by what God? By this plane tree. I take my solemn oath that unless you produce the discourse in the very presence of this plane tree, I will never read you another or tell you of another. Oh, oh, you wretch, how well you found out how to make a lover of discourse do your will. Then why, why, then why do you try to get out of it? I won't any more, since you have taken this oath. For how could I give up such pleasures? Speak, then. Do you know what I'm going to do? About what? I'm going to keep my head wrapped up while I talk, that I may get through my discourse as quickly as possible, and that I may not look at you and become embarrassed. Only speak, and in other matters suit yourself. Come then, O tuneful muses, whether you receive this name from the quality of your song or from the musical race of the Lycians, grant me your aid in, this, in the tale this most excellent man compels me to relate, that his friend, whom he has hitherto considered wise, may seem to him wiser still. Now there was once upon a time a boy 
or rather a stripling of great beauty. And he had many lovers, and among these was one of peculiar craftiness, who was as much in love with the boy as anyone, but had made him believe that he was not in love. And once in wooing him, he tried to persuade him of this very thing, that favors ought to be granted rather to the non-lover than to the lover. And his words were as follows. There is only one way, dear boy, for those to begin who are to take counsel wisely about anything. One must know what the counsel is about, or it is sure to be utterly futile. But most people are ignorant of the fact that they do not know the nature of things. So, supposing that they do know it, they come to no agreement in the beginning of their inquiry. And as they go on, they reach the natural result. They agree neither with themselves nor with each other. Now you and I must not fall into the error error which we condemn in others, but since we are to discuss the question whether the lover or the non-lover is to be preferred, let us first agree on a definition of love, its nature and its power, and then, keeping this definition in view and making constant reference to it, let us inquire whether love brings advantage or harm. Now everyone sees that love is a, des is a desire, and we know too that non-lovers also desire the beautiful. How then are we to distinguish the lover from the non-lover? We must observe that in each one of us there are two ruling and leading principles which we follow whithersoever they lead. One is the innate desire for pleasures, the other an acquired opinion which strives for the best. These two sometimes agree within us and are sometimes in strife, and sometimes one and sometimes the other has the greater power. Now when opinion leads through reason toward the best and is more powerful, its power is called self-restraint. But when desire irrationally drags us toward pleasures and rules within us, its rule is called excess. <coughs> now excess has many names, for it has many members and many forms. And whichever of these forms is most marked... Give its own, gives its own name, neither beautiful nor honorable, to him who possesses it. For example, if the desire for food prevails over the higher reason and the other desires, it is called gluttony, and he who possesses it will be called by the corresponding name of glutton. And again, if the desire for drink becomes the tyrant and leads him who possesses it toward drink, well, we know what he is called. And it is quite clear what fitting names of the same sort will be given when any desire akin to these acquires the rule. The reason for what I have said hitherto is pretty clear by this time, but everything is plainer when spoken than when unspoken. So, I say that the desire which overcomes the rational opinion that strives toward the right, and which is led away toward the enjoyment of beauty, and again is strongly forced by the desires that are kindred to itself toward personal beauty or physical beauty, when it gains the victory, takes its name from that very force and is called love. Well, my dear Phaedrus, does it seem to you, as it does to me, that I am inspired? Certainly, Socrates, you have an unusual fluency. Then listen to me in silence, for truly the place seems filled with a divine presence. So do not be surprised if I often seem to be in a frenzy as my discourse progresses, for I am already almost uttering dithyrambics. That is very true. And you are responsible for that. But hear what follows, for perhaps the attack may be averted. That, however, is in the hands of God. We must return to our boy. Well then, my dearest, what the subject is about which we are to take counsel has been said and defined. And now let us continue keeping our attention fixed upon that definition and tell what advantage or harm will naturally come from the lover or the non-lover to him who grants them his favors. He who is ruled by desire and is a slave to pleasure will inevitably desire to make his beloved as pleasing to himself as possible. Now, to one who is of unsound mind, everything is pleasant which does not oppose him. But everything that is better or equal is hateful. So the lover will not if he can help it, endure a beloved who is better than himself or his equal. 
but always makes him weaker and inferior. But the ignorant is inferior to the wise, the coward to the brave, the poor speaker to the eloquent, the slow of wit to the clever. Such mental defects, and still greater than these, in the beloved, will necessarily please the lover, if they are implanted by nature, and if they are not, he must implant them, or be deprived of his immediate enjoyment. And he is of necessity jealous, and will do him great harm, by keeping him from many advantageous associations, which would most tend to make a man of him, especially from that which would do most to make him wise. This is divine philosophy, and from it the lover will certainly keep his beloved away, through fear of being despised, and he will contrive to keep him ignorant of everything else, and make him look to his lover for everything, so that he will be most agreeable to him and most harmful to himself. In respect to the intellect, then, a man in love is by no means a profitable guardian or associate. We must next consider how he who is forced to follow pleasure and not good will keep the body of him whose master he is, and what care he will give to it. He will plainly court a beloved who is effeminate, not virile, not brought up in the pure sunshine, but in mingled shade, unused to manly toils and the sweat of exertion, but accustomed to a delicate and unmanly mode of life adorned with a bright complexion of artificial origin, since he has none by nature, and in general, living a life such as all this indicates, which it is certainly not worthwhile to describe further. We can sum it all up briefly and pass on. A person with such a body in war and in all important crises gives courage to his enemies and fills his friends and even his lovers themselves with fear. This may be passed over as self-evident, but the next question, what advantage or harm the intercourse and guardianship of the lover will bring to his beloved in the matter of his property, must be discussed. This must be discussed. Now, it is clear to everyone, and especially to the lover, that he would desire, above all things, to have his beloved bereft of the dearest and kindest and holiest possessions. For he would wish him to be deprived of father, mother, relatives and friends, thinking that they would hinder and censure and blame his most sweet intercourse with him. But he will also think that one who has property and money or other possessions will be less easy to catch, and when caught will be less manageable. Wherefore, the lover must necessarily begrudge his beloved the possession of property and rejoice at its loss. Moreover, the lover would wish his beloved to be as long as possible unmarried, childless and homeless, since he wishes to enjoy as long as possible what is pleasant to himself. Now there are also other evils, but God has mingled with most of them some temporary pleasure. So, for instance, a flatterer is a horrid creature and does great harm, yet nature has combined with him a kind of pleasure that is not without charm, and one might find fault with a courtesan as an injurious thing, and there are many other such creatures and practices which are yet for the time being very pleasant. But a lover is not only harmful to his beloved, but extremely disagreeable to live with as well. The old proverb says, birds of a feather flock together. That is, I suppose, equality of age leads them to similar pleasures, and through similarity begets friendship, and yet even they grow tired of each other's society. Now compulsion of every kind is said to be oppressive to everyone, and the lover not only is unlike his beloved, but he exercises the strongest compulsion, for he is old while his love is young, and he does not leave him day or night if he can help it, but is driven by the sting of necessity which urges him on, always giving him pleasure in seeing, hearing, touching, and by all his senses perceiving his beloved, so that he is glad to serve him constantly. But what consolation or what pleasure can he give the beloved? Must not this protracted intercourse bring him to the uttermost disgust as he looks at the old unlovely face and other things to match, which it is not pleasant even to hear about, to say nothing of being constantly compelled to come into contact with them? 
And he is suspiciously guarded in all ways against everybody and has to listen to untimely and exaggerated praises and to reproaches which are unendurable when the man is sober and when he is in his cups and indulge in, indulges in wearisome and unrestrained freedom of speech become not only unendurable but disgusting. And while he is in love, he is harmful and disagreeable. But when his love has ceased, he is thereafter false to him whom he formerly hardly induced to endure his worrisome companionship through the hope of future benefits by making promises with many prayers and oaths. But now that the time of payment has come, he has a new ruler and governor within him, sense and reason in place of love and madness, and has become a different person. But of this his beloved knows nothing. He asks of him a return for former favors, reminding him of past sayings and doings as if he were speaking to the same man. But the lover is ashamed to say that he has changed, and yet he cannot keep the oaths and promises he made when he was ruled by his former folly. Now that he has regained his reason and come to his senses, lest by doing what he formerly did he become again what he was, he runs away from these things, and the former lover is compelled to become a defaulter. The shell has fallen with the other side up, and he changes his part and runs away, and the other is forced to run after him in anger, and with imprecations, insults. He, did, he who did not know at the start that he ought never to have accepted a lover who was necessarily without reason, but rather a reasonable non-lover, for otherwise he would have to surrender himself to one who was faithless, irritable, jealous, and disagreeable, harmful to his property, harmful to his physical condition, and most harmful by far to the cultivation of his soul, than which there neither is nor ever will be anything of higher importance in truth, either in heaven or on earth. These things, dear boy, you must bear in mind, and you must know that the fondness of the lover is not a matter of good will, but of appetite which he wishes to satisfy. Just as the wolf loves the lamb, so the lover adores his beloved. There it is, Phaedrus. Do not listen to me any longer. Let my speech end here. But I thought you were in the middle of it, and would say as much about the non-lover as you've said about the lover to set forth all his good points, and to show that he ought to be favored. So now, Socrates, why do you stop? Did you not notice, my friend, that I am already speaking in hexameters, not mere dithyrambics, even though I am finding fault with the lover? But if I begin to praise the non-lover, what kind of hymn do you suppose I shall raise? I shall surely be possessed of the nymphs to whom you purposely expose me. So in a word I say that the non-lover possesses all the advantages that are opposed to the disadvantages we found in the lover. Why make a long speech? I have said enough about both of them, and so my tale shall fare as it may. I shall cross this stream and go away before you put some further compulsion upon me. Not yet, Socrates, till the heat has passed. Don't you see that it is already almost noon? Let us stay and talk over what has been said, and then, when it is cooler, we will go away. <coughs> Phaedrus, you are simply a superhuman wonder as regards discourses. I believe no one of all those who have been born in your lifetime has produced more discourses than you, either by speaking them yourself or compelling others to do so. I accept Simeus the Theban, but you are far ahead of all the rest, and now I think you have become the cause of another spoken by me. That is not exactly a declaration of war, but how is this? And what is the discourse? My good friend, when I was about to cross the stream, the spirit and the sign that usually comes to me came. It always holds me back from something I am about to do, and I thought I heard a voice from it which forbade my going away before clearing my conscience, as if I had committed some sin against deity. Now, I am a seer, not a very good one, but as the b bad writers say, good enough for my own purposes. So now I understand my error. How prophetic the soul is, my friend, for all along. While I was speaking my discourse, something troubled me, and I was distressed, as Ibicus says, lest I be buying honor among men by sinning against the gods. But now I have seen my error. What do you mean? 
Phaedrus, a dreadful speech it was, a dreadful speech, the one you brought with you and the one you made me speak. How so? It was foolish and somewhat impious. What could be more dreadful than that? Nothing, if you are right about it. Well, do you not believe that love is the son of Aphrodite and is a god? So it is said. Yes, but not by Lysias, nor by your speech, which was spoken by you through my mouth, that you bewitched. If love is, as indeed he is, a god or something divine, he can be nothing evil. But the two speeches just now said that he was evil. So then they sinned against love. But their foolishness was really very funny besides, for while they were saying nothing sound or true, they put on airs, as though they amounted to something. If they could cheat some mere mannequins, if they could cheat some mere mannequins and gain honor among them, now I, my friend, must purify myself. And for those who have sinned in matters of mythology, there is an ancient purification, unknown to Homer, but known to Stesichorus. For when he was stricken with blindness for speaking ill of Helen, he was not like Homer, ignorant of the reason. But since he was educated, he knew it, and straightway he writes the poem. That saying is not true. Thou didst not go within the well-oared ships, nor didst thou come to the walls of Troy. And when he had written all the poem, which is called the recantation, he saw again at once. Now I will be wiser than they in just this point. Before suffering any punishment for speaking ill of love, I will try to atone by my recantation with my head bare this time, not as before covered through shame. This indeed, Socrates, is the most delightful thing you could say. Just consider, my good Phaedrus, how shameless the two speeches were, both this of mine and the one you read out of the book. For if any man of noble and gentle nature who was himself in love with another of the same sort, or who had ever been loved by such a one, had happened to hear us saying that lovers take up violent enmity because of small matters, and are jealously disposed and harmful to the beloved. Don't you think he would imagine he was listening to people brought up among low sailors, who had never seen a generous love? Would he not refuse utterly to assent to our censure, our blame of love? I declare, Socrates, perhaps he would. I, therefore, because I am ashamed at the thought of this man and am afraid of love himself, wish to wash out the brine from my ears with the water of a sweet discourse. And I advise Lysias also to write as soon as he can that other things being equal, the lover should be favored rather than the non-lover. Be assured that he will do so, for when you have spoken the praise of the lover, Lysias must, of course, be compelled by me to write another discourse on the same subject. I believe you so long as you are what you are. Speak then without fear. Well, where is the youth to whom I was speaking? He must hear this also. Lest he do not hear it, he accept a non-lover before we can stop him. Here he is, always close at hand whenever you want him. Understand then, fair youth, that the former discourse was by Phaedrus, the son of Pythocles, eager for fame of Myrinus, Myrtown, but this which I shall speak is by Stesichorus, son of Euphemus, man of pious speech, of Himera, town of desire. And I must say that this saying is not true, which teaches that when a lover is at hand, the non-lover non should be more favored, because the lover is insane, and the other sane. For if it were a simple fact that insanity is an evil, the saying would be true. But in reality, the greatest of blessings come to us through madness when it is sent as a gift of the gods. For the prophetess at Delphi and the priestesses at Dodona, when they have been mad, have conferred many splendid benefits upon Greece, both in private and in public affairs but few or none when they have been in their right minds. And if we should speak of the Sibyl and all the others, who by prophetic inspiration have foretold many things to many persons, and thereby made them fortunate afterwards, anyone can see that we should speak a long time. And it is worthwhile to adduce also the fact that those men of old who invented names thought that madness was neither shameful nor disgraceful. 
Otherwise, they would not have connected the very word mania with the noblest of arts, that which foretells the future, by calling it the manic art. No, they gave this name thinking that mania, when it comes by gift of the gods, is a noble thing. But nowadays, people call prophecy the mantic art, tastelessly inserting a T in the word, a tau in the word. So also, when they gave a name to the investigation of the future, which rational persons conduct through observation of birds and by other signs, since they furnish my news and information historia to human thought, oasis from the intellect, the anoia. They called it oionistic, oionistike, the oionistic art, which modern folk now call oionistic, making it more high sounding by introducing the long omega. The ancients then testify that in proportion as prophecy mantike is superior to augury, both in name and in fact, in the same proportion, madness, which comes from God, is superior to sanity, which is of human origin. Moreover, when diseases and the greatest troubles have been visited upon certain families through some ancient guilt, madness has entered in, and by oracular power has found a way of release for those in need, taking refuge in prayers and the service of the gods, and so by purifications and sacred rites, he who has this madness is made safe for the present and the aftertime. And for him who is rightly possessed of madness, a release from present ills is found. And a third kind of possession in madness comes from the muses, that this takes hold upon a gentle and pure soul, arouses it and inspires it to songs and other poetry, and thus by adorning countless deeds of the ancients, educates later generations. But he who without the divine madness comes to the doors of the muses, confident that he will be a good poet by art, meets with no success, and the poetry of the sane man vanishes into nothingness before that of the inspired madman. All these noble results of inspired madness I can mention and many more. Therefore let us not be afraid on that point, and let no one disturb and frighten us by saying that the reasonable friend should be preferred to him who is in a frenzy. Let him show in addition that love is not sent from heaven for the advantage of lover and beloved alike, and we will grant him the prize of victory. We on our part must prove that such madness is given by the gods for our greatest happiness, and our proof will not be believed by the merely clever, but will be accepted by the truly wise. First, then, we must learn the truth about the soul divine and human by observing how it acts and is acted upon, and the beginning of our proof is as follows. Every soul is immortal. For okay. that... Let's yes. hold it there. Okay. Just glance at that paragraph. Thank you. Thank you much. Yeah. Take a look at that paragraph. The one we're about to read? Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, um, what do you see that he's doing from 
234 to 236. Mm-hmm. Just kind of scan it for a minute. What do you choose to do? It seemed to me he was baiting the man to, to have him ask for more. As he kept trying to get away from the discourse. Mm-hmm. They just kept saying, no, 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 come on, come on, give it to me. And he would play with that. Right, this is what I got out of that. Or, come on, what do you see, clerk? Between two th- where we began to 236. If you had to put that into subjects, what would you think a good place to put it? It's talking about the dynamics of the relationship between him and Phaedrus to a certain degree. Mm Mm-hmm. Robert, do it again. No, I just said part of it is he's talking about the relationship between him and Phaedrus. True. And that there's a certain resemblance between that no. and other dynamics. No. Mentioned. It's a, <coughs> um, well, I see that he's talking to Phaedrus and he objects, but. Um, Although Phaedrus doesn't directly say that he could do a better speech, it's like Socrates is indicating that he is. He can. And so he's picking up from Phaedrus that that, um, that he can. That Phaedrus can do a better speech. You're quite right, but that didn't tell me what he, category to put it right. in. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It didn't answer the question, but... I Where would you put it? Well, he criticizes the rhetorical style. That's so true. it's therefore that the critical class that is a subsect of the study of rhetoric, the study of rhetoric, hey. the art of There's, rhetoric. Are there principles of rhetoric in here then? Yes or no? Yes. Does he allow us to see the way he's judging rhetoric at this point? Yes. Take a look. Yes or no? For if they are standards of rhetoric, we want to see how he will apply them in the forthcoming speech. Look here. Go back, quick. Let me pull a couple of paragraphs. All right, what's the source of the speech, whether it comes out of oneself or someone else? How should you judge it? Would you agree there are certain standards of kinds of speeches, whether arrangement and invention, under what conditions one should be praised and what not? Does he not? Mm-hmm. All right. The role of the obvious, what, whether or not, how much credit you should give for what ought to be said, right? We can say the obvious, etc. Then invention. Ah, good, good. So if that's the case, uh, what is he doing with the tale of the boy? What does that allow him to do? Him to the boy is a 
beloved. What is he? He's a lover. He's a lover. He's a beloved. Not peering as a non lover. More. That's the boy is in a lover appearing as an author. <clears throat> I'll get that. Not the boy is in the tale of the boy. Gotcha. Right? The there's the story of the lover appearing as a non lover to gain the boy. <laughs> right. Uh, but would you not agree he goes beyond that? And he talks about the cycle of the love. From youth to age. Mm -hmm. And what happens in the behavior and the promises and everything else, does he not? Yeah, it even, it even makes like a little story about it. Mm. By the way, <clears throat> What does this do to the whole speech of Phaedrus? Undermines the, the speech that he got from Lysias. No, it supports it. Could that be Lysias? Could this be an example of Lysias and Phaedrus? Lysias is appearing, appearing as a non-lover in order to gain the boy. Is he in some way predicting, hey, I'll tell you what's going to happen in this kind of an affair? <laughs> But if that's the case, within it, would you agree, he does something quite interesting for us. <clears throat> what hasn't been done before, uh, he gets a definition of love. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. And if you were to ask where, 237D, do you agree? Does he, you know, does he then uh, talk about the struggle once you have the definition of love? Does that presuppose, therefore, there's going to be a struggle going on with love between two forces, innate desire versus acquired opinion? Mm -hmm. There it is. Is that the way he proceeds? Yeah, your other point? Uh, that he also, he sets out how to go about a definition properly. Oh, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And so therefore he's, he also defines definition as well yeah. as love. That's true. Um, There's only one way, dear boy, for those to begin who are to take counsel wisely about okay. anything. One must know what the counsel is about or it's sure, it is sure to be utterly futile. But most people are ignorant of the fact that they do not know the nature of things. Oh. So supposing that they do know it, they come to no agreement at the beginning of their inquiry, and as they go on, they reach a natural result. They agree not either with themselves nor with each other. Now you and I must not fall into the error which we condemn in others, but since we are to discuss the question whether the lover or the non-lover is to be preferred, did you hear that? Good, good. The first <laughs> conclusion? Agree on a definition of love. Yeah, but you're building to... What? It's nature and his power, and then keeping this definition in view and making constant reference to it, let us inquire whether love brings advantage or harm. No. Right, I'm so, trying. I'm sorry. I was just saying, like a way of proceeding in regards to defining, uh, or, or or the entire sorry, his entire uh, speech afterwards or argument afterwards, he, he sets out right there. Okay. Sorry. Are you adding to the structure? I don't know. Well, that's what we need to know. Well, oh, take a look. Okay, let's look like from here. Where does it go from here? Come on, we're talking about structure. What structure do you mean when you ask me if I'm adding to it here? What do I mean by structure? Yeah, what structure? Identifying key parts and seeing how they follow one from the other and seeing whether there is a transition from one section to the other. Structure. But you know that. 
Yeah, I guess the reason why I was reading that is because I was seeing that he sets out his he sets out ahead of time how he plans on proceeding through speaking about this particular definition of love, right? And he calls it, you know, taking counsel wisely or, or you know, functioning wisely. And that seemed important to mention that he's like this is where you need that great word. Because he wants to give him a model for how to use his mind and proceed in a methodical way, and therefore he's teaching him dialectic right here. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, I, okay, I tried look to here. do it. Look, look here. Don't, don't worry about what I'm going to say. Just worry about what you're going to say. All right. Look, okay? Stay with us. You're introducing a notion. Mm. He's going to add to it by talking about acquired opinion. Mm. He's bringing in the way in which you should build your opinions about a definition of love. He's full, continuing the theme of acquired opinion, and he's going to take it a step further in the next section, does he not? Mm -hmm. If we pick it up and see if that proceeds the way we're talking at, uh, just before you get to 239. Take a look. Because if you keep, if you keep, your, if you keep your mind on this definition, he's telling us, right? If you keep your mind on this definition, building a new piece, right? it's going to follow that you're going to be involved in the next discussion, mm -hmm. right? Which is essentially two words he uses, weaker and stronger, does he not? Superior and inferior, which is a distribution of power. Mm -hmm. but, um, is it power released? but especially in respect to the mind, mm -hmm. right? To someone who has an unsound mind, to someone who has a sound mind, and that continues acquired opinions. Mm -hmm. opinion. Right? Because if you keep this idea of love, dealing with these two ideas, you should, ideally, be able to finish what he has said. Look here, if all you have is the structure, then you should be able to, keeping the structure in mind, fill in the details, and that's his speech. That's structure. Remember, we're dealing with with the major word. What benefit? What harm? Anything affects anything. What benefit accrues? What harm is occasioned? And in this case, given love and the beloved, uh, under what circumstances? When one has more power or superior, the other inferior, let's take a look at the way in which this breaks through. Is that what he's doing? If you take a look at... Uh... But the next question, what advantage or harm the intercourse and guardianship of the lover will bring to his beloved? And then he's going to specify in certain areas, might he not? Yeah. Such as property, reputation, etc., does he not? So, ideally, if you have a mind on the particular categories, you should think about how you could talk about the same categories using either the same terms or other terms, or, pardon me, other examples. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
He brings in other examples with Eden. Yeah. Yeah. And pulls it there as well. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, inferior input, therefore, also is going to have benefit, harm, temporary, lasting. Right. So he's taking this idea. Ah, right now, he's really working on this side. Harm, temporary, benefit should be lasting. <laughs> And since this is going on from youth to old age, remember, he then has a conclusion. He's going to pull it together, isn't he? Disgusting. Therefore, at 2.42, okay, so much now, okay. That's enough. There it is. Do not listen to me anymore. Let my speech end here. It's over. So look here. He hasn't done this. This is left. This is open. This is open. I right, just touched one. Matter of fact, I think there's only two sentences that deal with it. Therefore, he's really beginning the negative side of love. There's, oh my gosh, tears. Oh, I'm going to have to recount for the injustices I have committed. Is that what he does at 243? <laughs> okay, now, you see, any, any subject you deal with, and we're taking love, all right, He's going this way first. What's going on in the soul and the body? Right. Nature, there isn't the kind of love he's talking about since there's no role for an acquired opinion or rational. Then he wants to take the, the, the broader view, that from there. He's going to say, well, we've only touched on the negative side, therefore, we must now look at the positive side. Right, when he looks at the positive side, he's now going to have to relate it oh, yeah. uh -huh. That's a dialectical way of looking at a subject. And we can follow him. We can follow what he's doing. He's going to tell us, therefore, the journey of the soul up through this, under the aspect of love. He starts by saying, look, as you look at it, go, not this way. He's not going towards nature. He's going up. That's right, not nature. I should put this up further up. Now, if you're talking about love in the body, that's easy. There aren't a lot of negatives. But if, if there is love in the soul, you have to talk about the soul, don't you? You have to talk about the soul. What kind of a thing it is for there to be love in it. Especially when it's a influence. Now, notice he's going this way. Where there's an influence from the divine. A madness, frenzy. There's also a human kind of madness, but that's kind of pathological, a different kind of madness. He said, this is really, this now becomes the major subject. And how do some of these people become influenced by the divine? And this realm is the divine. Mm. 
Oh, that's got to be influenced by it. So we can chart, we can chart what he's doing now in the speech. And you can't talk about love unless you talk about the nature of the soul. So therefore, where we left off, and I asked you to just take a look at that paragraph, that's the section on soul. Well, once he has that, then he has to go to the next step and talk about how love comes and influences the level of the soul. And soul and body. That's where he's going to go. And he has... Uh, And it brings about the highest unity, of course, or unity itself. So, I thought we'd just kind of uh, uh, just see how he does that for a moment. I must say that this saying is not true, which teaches that when a lover is at hand, the non-lover should be more favored, because the lover is insane, the other sane. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> right, I'm going to reject that. This saying is not true. So when a lover, a beloved is between the two, Non lover, lover. Then, then, given that condition, how should this person decide? So, look here, Lysias is saying this. Because this person is mad, this person is sane. But in reality, the greatest of blessings comes to us through madness, when it's sent as a gift to the gods. Now, he's going to call our everyday sanity close to madness, or far distant from that beneficial madness that comes from the gods. Look what he's doing. The prophetess is at Delphi, the priestess is at Dona, when they have been mad, have conferred many splendid benefits upon Greece. And when they're in the right minds, nothing proceeds. And Sybil and all the others, by prophetic inspiration, have told many things to many persons, and thereby made them fortunate afterwards. Therefore, he now makes a distinction between mantic, right? Right, mantic and augury, right, that whole paragraph on 244 CD. Mm -hmm. Coming to this great statement, an analogy. The ancients then testify in an analogy as prophecy is superior to augury, both in name and in fact, in the same proportion, madness which comes from God is superior to sanity which is of human origin. Now, this next line is very interesting to us, is it not? Which he repeats in another way. Moreover, when diseases and greatest troubles have been visited upon certain families through some ancient guilt, madness has entered in, and by oracular power has found a way to release of release for those in need, 
uh, taking refuge in prayers and the service of the gods. And so by purification and sacred rites, he who has this madness is made safe for the present and for the after time. And for him who is rightly possessed of madness, a release from present ills is found. A third kind of madness, right? Ah, comes to the muses. It rouses and inspires it to song, poetry, and by adorning countless deeds of the ancients, that ed educates later generations. Hey, without the divine madness, nothing, nothing worthwhile. These are the noble results of inspired madness. You have the three? He breaks it into two. See, earlier he talked about the Sybil. who by prophetic inspiration uh, foretold many things of, to many persons and made them fortunate afterwards. And in a way, he's picking that up, that D. What do you call this? Moreover, when diseases and the greatest troubles have been visited upon certain families, through some ancient guilt, madness has entered in and by oracular power has found a way of release from those in need, taking refuge in prayers in the service of the gods and so by purification and sacred rites. He who has this madness is made safe for the present and to time after. It's shamanic. It's, no. It's purificatory. Yeah, purificatory. Fine. What else, what, what fits into that? Shomatic, he said. I said sh what? Shomatic, he said too. What else? Shamanic. Yeah, yeah. shamanic. Yeah. Heroic. What? Some type of heroic uh, uh, <clears throat> member of a family that's saving the family in some way. Yeah, you see what's better about the modern world, we don't have this anymore. That's better. Right, Miss? <laughs> we don't? No. <laughs> Problems don't go through families over time. I mean, you couldn't trace anyone's problem back through generations, could you? <laughs> Look at the guy laughs. So then. I'm trying to... Mine, you can. <laughs> <laughs> Oracular power is what he says. That's what you need. That's your madness. What do... So, Look at Got one, two, three? Prophetic. Now, what kind of... Prophetic is he talking about? What is prophecy for this guy? Well, basically, if he goes by the symbols, it's prophecy for good things. So oh, yeah? How to make their life better and where they're going to take it. Yeah. So that's just that's just a different way of looking at yeah. it. The first thing is just here's a good way to go follow my run. The second one is go pray and get what you need. And the third one is So the priestess come on. Who are they? The prophet is at Delphi, the priestess is at Dodona. Yeah. Right. When they become mad and not in their right minds, they confer all kinds of blessings upon us, both now to and foretold many things. Um, I knew someone who could pull this stunt off. Uh, I think I have a copy of it. Oh, yeah. yeah. An old book I happen to have. <laughs> um,
See, augury and prophecy is being described in the ion as two kinds of prophecy, right? Divine. And here's Theoclymenos. And he's, of course, in the Odyssey. And before the event takes place, which of course is Odysseus facing the suitors and finally the great scene where he's massacring all of the suitors, before that he's seeing poor souls, what mischief's upon you. Night is wrapped about your heads and faces down to your feet. There's a blaze of wailing, cheeks bedabbled. The porch is full, the hall is full of specters hurrying to hell and darkness. And the sun put out in heaven, a foul mist covers all. Right, he's seeing, he's seeing what's going to take place in the future in his moment being present. He's, right, he's there watching, he's watching in advance. That's prophecy, that's prophecy. Luggery. A black cat came across my path as I tried to cross. Oh, oh excuse me. <laughs> oh. That's oh, awkward. That's 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 Using good. natural phenomena, natural phenomena. To, to conclude about certain things that are going to take place. Mm-hmm. Omenology, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Got those two? Is that a big difference between the two? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's that gap between the two is the same gap between divine madness and being sane in the everyday world. <laughs> Which means it's a big gap. A hell of a gap. <laughs> right? One is being there, the other is making believe you can understand something before it happens, based upon natural occasions which have nothing to do with the future event. Oh. Yeah. Superstitious. So, if that's it, then would you not agree that man has to um, get into the great contest? All right, that great contest. At uh, 245 <coughs> B.C., all these noble results of inspired madness, I can mention and many more. Therefore, let us not be afraid on that point, and let no one disturb and frighten us by saying that the reasonable friend should be preferred to him who is in a frenzy. Here's the contest now. Let him show in addition that love is not sent from heaven for the advantage of the lover and the beloved alike, and we'll grant him the prize of victory. We, on our part, must prove that such madness is given by the gods for our greatest happiness and our proof, our proof will not be believed by the merely clever, but will be accepted by the truly wise. First, then, we must learn the truth about the soul, divine and human, by observing, observing how it acts and is acted upon. Right, what's he doing? We, on our part, must prove that such man is given by the gods. Hey, <laughs> for... for Plato, and especially as Proclus mentions, the gods are right here. They're above the divine or the nature of being, and he's saying this power, love, which is mad, a madness, proceeds down to us 
we on our part must prove that such madness is given by the gods. Oh, that's good. You have to show it's given by the gods for our greatest happiness, greatest benefit. And our proof uh, won't be believed by the ordinary people, but um, the wise will take it. First, then, we must learn the truth about the soul divine, the soul, not the soul and body. So we must learn the truth about this. That's what we've got to do. Right? The soul divine and human. by observing two things, how it acts and is acted upon. That's what we're going to do. So we've got a pretty good task. We must prove that the madness, divine madness, is given by the gods. First goal. Ah, huh, that's pretty good. Mm. And it's for our greatest happiness. Then we must learn the truth about the divine soul. And the human soul. By focusing on how it acts and what acts upon it. That's our task. One, two, three, by studying how it acts and is acted upon. Hmm. It's also, it's his task for himself too, right? It's his task for himself. I didn't follow. Well, he's setting up his own homework assignment, his own job ahead of oh, time. Oh yeah, it's a contest. Yeah. It's a contest. They have to do that, we'll, we'll do that. It's a contest, great contest. And that's why he starts formally into his speech with the immortality of the soul, right here. So he picks this up. Not this, not one, he picks it up from two. Agree? That's where we're going? See what he's doing? And we can hold him to it. It's a contest. It's an IOU. Mm. Okay. Now, the kind of proof he's going to give, right, is a brief. It's not, not it's a brief thing. And actually, he's only going to give a figure. He could talk about it at length, but this is just a figure. He's going to give a figure of two. So he's going to give us a figure. Concerning the immortality of the soul, this is enough. But about its form, we must speak in the following manner. Oh. What does it assume? It assumes we have under our belt the description of the soul that goes from 245D to 246. So therefore, jumping into the soul at 245C, we need a reader. Thank you, Daniel. Every soul. Every soul is immortal. That which is ever moving is immortal. But that which moves something else or is moved by something else 
When it ceases to move, ceases to live. Only that which moves itself, since it does not leave itself, never ceases to move. And this is also the source and beginning of motion for all other things which have motion. But the beginning is ungenerated. For everything that is generated must be generated from a beginning. But the beginning is not generated from anything. For if the beginning were generated from anything, it would not be generated from a beginning. And since it is ungenerated, it must all be also indestructible. For if the beginning were destroyed, it could never be generated from anything, nor anything else from it, since all things must be generated from a beginning. Thus, that which moves itself must be the beginning of motion. And this can be neither destroyed nor generated. Otherwise, all the heavens and all generation must fall in ruin and stop and never again have any source of motion or origin. But since that which is moved by itself has been seen to be immortal, one who says that this self-motion is the essence and the very idea of the soul will not be disgraced. For every body which derives motion from without is soulless. But that which has its motion within itself has a soul, since that is the nature of the soul. But if this is true, that that which moves itself is nothing else than the soul, then the soul would necessarily be ungenerated and immortal. Now, and we could talk plenty about the immortality of the soul, but we're not, because he's only going to <clears throat> put it into a form, a form and a figure. That, take the next sentence only, right? Take a look, sir. Concerning the immortality of the soul, this is enough. Ha, ah, it's form. We must speak in the following manner. And therefore, he's going to give us a figure. And that becomes what we now talk about as the soul, as a figure, charioteer, horses, etc., which is a good place to quit. Right? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So where are we going? Jump. Um, I don't understand where he says, for every body which derives motion from without, from without is soul. Yeah, yeah, watch. Well, what about the well, no, soul no, and the well, <coughs> Soulless. Go ahead. But the body derives motion from without. Mm. Body derives its motion from without. That's true. Therefore, there's something in our body that drives the body. Okay. The body itself is Okay. Yeah, okay. Take a break.